Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for our audience uh, based in Asia Pacific. And today we're going to take this opportunity to organize a webinar called Global Renewable Energy Investment Trend. But this uh, webinar will focus on the Chinese market, uh, the world's largest renewable energy market. So uh, luckily we got uh, three speakers from the industry leading organization today join me to discuss the current global renewable energy investment status and we'll share, we're going to share the renewable investment policy in China, the opportunity uh, moving forward. Uh, also, we got the chance to invite a guest speaker from a foreign investor who has asset in renewable operating in China. Uh, and we, ha we will have the opportunity to listen to them uh, to share their experience, the outlook, et cetera. So uh, first, let me introduce the first speaker, uh, Jonas Sanron. He's uh, working for Bloomberg Liu Energy Finance based in Beijing office. He is a China renewable energy analyst following the market uh, closely. So in today's presentation, he's going to bring us the big picture about the global renewable energy investment trends and opportunity. Um, so this stage is yours, um, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you, Feng. I hope people can hear me. Um, due to the, um, let's just say, unique way Bloomberg's network is set up, I unfortunately can't access the webinar portal, so I'm dialing in via telephone and will be asking the kind colleagues at GWAC to flip slides for me. So uh, everyone, please pardon the slides instructions. Um, I want to say thank you to GWAC for inviting Bloomberg and NEF to participate in this important webinar. Um, we at BNF have been tracking the trends and dynamics of global clean energy industry for about a decade now, and um, I'm glad to share with you the latest updates we see. On slide number one, um, we see that the late, the last, uh, we see that last year was the fifth in a row in which global clean energy investment exceeded the $300 billion mark at around $332 billion last year, according to our estimates. That number is about 5% below the historic high we recorded in 2017. The main causes of this, as people can pretty easily figure out, is China. Last year's major solar policy change in mid-year resulted in a 24% drop in global solar investment. Of course, most of it was felt domestically in China. In the first half of this year, we see another 14% year-on-year reduction in global investment. Slide number two shows the investment specifically in China. The first half of this year, we saw a 39% slowdown in China's renewable energy investment. The 29 billion US dollar we tracked in this market is the, slowest, is the lowest figure for any half year period since 2013. There are both um, cyclical and structural reasons for China's slowdown. The temporary cost, which was the long policymaking period China experienced in the first five months of, the, of this year, has passed. Apart from us not seeing the final policy until the end of May, environmental constraints and grid permitting issues are also at play. Starting from the second quarter, we have seen a rebound in investment already in China, especially in wind, and we expect to continue to see uh, the rebound in the second half of the year. On slide number three, we see that the investment in the US has been pretty stable over the past three to four years and at a reasonably high level. We expect the level of spending to increase um, as projects rush to secure tax incentives before they phase out. Slide number four shows a slightly different story in Europe where investment have come down from the historic high in the early 2010s. The upside lately mainly come from offshore wind and more recently solar, on the back of many countries' intention to meet their 2020 clean energy targets. Overall, as slide number five shows, the center of growth in global new investment in clean energy has shifted geographically from EMEA to APAC, Americas, as well as EMEA, have stabilized in recent years. Let's go to slide six, please. If we tally up the total investment we recorded over the past decade, 
It amounts to about 2.6 trillion US dollars. More than half went to solar, some 1.3 trillion dollars. Wind um, got about 1 trillion dollar. Biomass, small hydro, biofuels, and geothermal um, takes the rest. Wind and solar absolutely dominated the investments. When we break the investment over the past decade down to countries, at least 20 have spent more than 14 billion US dollars on uh, 14 billion US dollars on renewables. The runaway leader, obviously, is China, which invested some uh, 758 billion US dollars. That's nearly 31 percent of the global total, and more than all European countries combined. This list also includes a number of developing countries, um, led by well China, but um, also India with about 90 billion US dollars. You see several other, uh, several other developing countries in the latter part of the list. In most cases, developing countries have only broken into their strides on renewables investments since solar and wind costs came down to uh, competitive levels in mid-decade. So we could expect to see them um, taking up higher positions in later years. In the investment space, sometimes less is good. Um, less is good, uh, especially when something is less costly, obviously. Um, slide number seven shows the LCOE global benchmarks we track since 20, 2009. The levelized costs of solar, both for tracking and non-tracking, have come down by over 85% since 2009. For wind, that number is over 50% as well, even for offshore wind. Um, the trend for battery storage is, is even steeper. This means that countries can invest less dollars for more megawatts. There are a number of reasons for this LCOE reduction. On slide number eight, we show how scale and technology have progressed. They undoubtedly are the main causes for cost reduction. The gray areas on the top three charts show the cumulative installed capacity for solar, wind, and battery packs. As these technologies quickly scale up, the cost come down as manufacturing gains economies of scale. We recognize that PV modules, wind turbines, and battery packs have learning rates of 28%, 11%, and 18% respectively. That is to say that for every doubling of cumulative capacity, the cost of modules, turbines, and battery packs come down by that much. But, but it's not just scale. Technologies are getting better too. Module efficiency, wind farm capacity factor, and battery cell energy density have all increased significantly in the past years. They also make clean energy cheaper to invest. Another push for cost reduction comes from auctions. Slide number nine shows the latest auction results from UK's CFD round three, announced only a couple of days ago. And boys, are they cheap, especially when considering that these include the full scope of transmission. We levelized the winning bids to calculate the expected revenue over a 25-year full lifetime, and the prices sit slightly below $50 per megawatt hour which is actually not that unusual in Europe these days. Let's go to slide number 10, please. Across the world, most mature countries now use auctions to bring clean energy projects to markets. We have tracked 235 gigawatts of auctioned capacity globally as of July this year, and another 88 gigawatts um, have been planned. On slide number 11, we can see that 2019 has the potential to hit a new record high for auctioned clean energy volume. Right now, already awarded volume amounts to 43 gigawatts this year, and at least another 53 gigawatts is in the pipeline. They may not totally materialize, all of them, but still, there's a very high upside. Slide 12, please. Asset finance is obviously a majority of clean energy investment, but also important are research and development and equity raised for renewable energy companies on public markets and from venture capital and private equity investors. Over the past decade, we see VC funding 
come, become less significant than it was in 2010, while annual corporate R&D has almost doubled. We also separated investment in small distributed capacity from asset finance. This is a space that has attracted sustained interest. Though the chart on the right shows that investment in this segment peaked in 2011, this has much to do with the rapid falling costs of solar equipment. The years 2010 to 2012 saw heavy spending on small scale PV at high prices per kilowatt, especially in European countries like Germany and Italy that offered attractive feed-in tariffs. Those booms have faded and although China, Japan, and the US have been strong players in small-scale solar in recent years, unit costs have been lower. Investment in the distributed energy space has not just gone to projects, but also companies. These companies are not just doing power generation, but increasingly doing energy services. On slide 13, we can see that large utilities, as well as oil and gas companies, have acquired in recent years many independent decentralized energy companies. These buyers have customers, but not necessarily the technology to service a vast number of them. So acquisition has been a major strategy. We expect decentralized energy to continue to grow, as slide number 14 shows. By 2050, we think major power markets can achieve between 10 to 40% of power generation decentralization. Australia will lead the way, while China will be relatively low because of the existing capacity and plans for long distance transmission lines. In the next couple of slides, I want to share some near-term headwinds, headwinds uh, to clean energy investment we see in the market. The first is government policies. Slide 15 um, shows uh, the, the situation in Mexico. Mexico's new president has shaped its energy policy to be increasingly focused on strengthening the role of state-owned utilities at the expense of private companies. A direct reflection is the cancellation of the country's fourth long-term clean energy auction earlier this year. Even though Private auctions have since spun up. The scale is currently limited. Whether it's adopting auctions in the likes of Ukraine, cancel auctions in Mexico, subsidy free auctions in China, FIT reductions in Vietnam, all these policies can bring short term shock to investment and the market. Macroeconomics um, are also playing a role. Slide 16, please. Argentina has suffered a currency crisis and a recession, which has impacted renewable, energy ability, renewable energy's ability to secure debt. By February this year, only one solar project disclosed financing in the 1.7 gigawatt awarded in the November 2017 auction round. It is possible that some projects will go ahead on the basis of corporate borrowing. However, we do expect the lack, of, the lack of project finance will curtail or delay many projects. Slide 17 shows another constraint that has troubled China for much of this year, as well as many other countries. That's grid limitations. Eight provinces marked red in this chart did not participate in this year's national solar auction in China, largely due to grid constraints. This has become this has become the top factor determining the speed of growth in China's renewable market going forward. Finally, some environmental concerns have also come back to the sector, especially surrounding offshore wind. Slide 18, please. This year, the worry is not so much the impact from a single turbine or even a single project, but offshore wind in scale and whether it will impact the environment in ways we did not expect before. As the CEO of the Business Network for Offshore Wind said to Bloomberg News, um, as the screenshot on the left shows, requiring a project to assess the, the impacts of all potential future projects, even though those future projects are not yet de defined, is extraordinary. We think these challenges are real, 
but they are likely to be short term. In the long run, as slide 19 shows, the competitiveness of renewables is a fact impossible to ignore. That is why we think wind and solar have the potential to supply almost half of global power by 2050. To achieve that, we estimate that we need about $10 trillion of new investment in renewables. And we continue to be confident about their long-term potential. And that's all of my uh, presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. It's an excellent presentation. And uh, uh, from the slides you present today, we can see, I'm glad to see that, um, you know, uh, the change in the renewable sector, uh, it's clearly indicate the renewable investment um, has shipped from Europe to APEC region, especially in China, uh, as the largest uh, renewable market for wind and solar PV installation. So it's not a surprise that we see a lot of investment uh, in China. Uh, the last slide also indicates the energy mix uh, up to 2050. Uh, it's a, a clear indication that we are on the way for the transition, even though we are not there, but uh, we will get there one day. So our next speaker uh, is um, from China Renewable Energy uh, Industry Association, uh, Mr. Wang Wei Quan. Uh, Mr. Wang has been following the Chinese renewable market over the past nearly 15 years. He's focused on the industry and market analysis for all renewable uh, technology. Uh, in his presentation, Mr. Wang will bring us the latest Chinese renewable energy policy, and most importantly, the investment environment for foreign investors. Okay, now the stage is yours, Mr. Wang. Thank you. Mr. Wang, are you still online? Excuse me, everyone. Hello. Probably there were some technical problem for Mr. Wang to dial in uh, directly from Beijing. Uh, well, our colleague is coordinate uh, with him. Uh, let's shift to the next speaker. Uh, sorry about that. And so for the next speaker, uh, it's uh, Mr. Erwin Debolz. He's the vice president for China Offshore Wind from EDF Renewable. We all know EDF, it's uh, one of the largest utility based in Paris. And uh, this company is taking the meat in terms of energy transition. Uh, as a long standing uh, investor in China, uh, EDF has been working uh, with utility and doing a lot of investment, not just in the traditional energy resources, actually renewable as well. So. Now let's uh, uh, switch to uh, Ervan. He's going to bring us the perspective from a European investor um, point. And he's going to also mention uh, or showcase their renewable investment in China and share their experience. All right, the stage is yours, Ervan. Thank you.
I'm sorry, everyone. Probably we also had the technical problem with the third speaker from EDF, um, pretty uh, Barry and Matt, um, or our colleagues uh, in the conversation directly. Uh, we will see if we can solve the challenge uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Hello. Mm. Hello, Mr. Devos. Can you hear us? Okay, please, thank you. Uh, would you please, um, Mr. Debo, uh, would you please step a little bit closer to your microphone? Thank you. So we can hear you. Can you hear me well now? Okay. Okay. So I will say a word about CDF group uh, and CDF in Rivo and the activity of CDF in China before uh, before um, I'm sorry, everyone, but probably uh, it went into a technical issue again. Um, let's switch back to Mr. Wang. Let's see if he's uh, online right now. Mr. Wang, can you hear us from Beijing? Thank you.
So everyone, well, we'll still solve the problem um, for both speaker based in Beijing. Uh, let's get back to Jonathan. We have one interesting question from the audience. Uh, Jonathan, there is one question for you. Uh, one of the speaker want to know uh, what's what's the impact on the offshore uh, what's the impact of the offshore wind farm on the Taiwanese white dolphin? So could you elaborate a bit? Thank you. Hello, Jonathan. Are you there? Hello? Can I hear Beijing? Yeah, yeah Mr. Zhao, now, now it's okay. It's yes, we can hear you now. Please go ahead. Okay. So, uh, just uh, for your information, everyone just left uh, for our ur urgency. So, I'm here to replace him. Okay? All right. So. Okay, before you start, let me just quick, uh, quickly introduce yes. you. For the slide? Uh, yes. Um, okay, um, my name is, so, name is Joey. I, I'm, I'm working for EDF Renewable China team uh, in charge of the offshore OINM. So uh, for EDF, uh, so of course the EDF uh, uh, is the first uh, uh, worldwide nuclear power generation company and uh, the number one renewable generation company in Europe as well. Uh, our uh, activity covers generation, transmission, distribution, trading, and uh, energy service. So EDF is a state-owned company with about 84% uh, of the share owned by the states. Uh, we have a public service uh, mission and we also we are international group so one third of the sales made outside france and our target is to triple this business uh, target from now on uh, by 2030. so the load capacity by the end of last year uh, worldwide is about 126 gigawatt uh, so uh, and then we go to next slide uh, we have uh, uh, presence in uh, about 26 countries in the world. So we have uh, 10 million customers outside France. So our main target is in Europe, uh, Asia, and uh, Africa, and uh, America. Uh, uh, we move to slide four. So for renewable, uh, we our target is to play a key role in the renewable world. Uh, so the total installation capacity for renewable until the end of last year is about 12.5 gigawatts uh, worldwide. The net uh, uh, G, uh, capacity for our shares, net shares, is about uh, 8 uh, gigawatts. Uh, our competence covered, uh, co covers development, construction, uh, production, asset management, and OINM for uh, onshore wind offshore wind and the PV. Uh, now we move to slide five. So 80% uh, of our renew, uh, renewable uh, capacity is for onshore and offshore, 90% for solar, PV, and one for other segments like uh, energy storage, biomass, and biogas. 
We move now to slide six. So uh, we have an uh, integrated skill. So in terms of uh, development, of course, we are professional for uh, prospection uh, for the land, electricity production, uh, yield assessment, environmental impact study, etc. And for construction, we are in charge of engineering, construction management, and procurement. For assets, uh, we manage the relation with the contractors and with the uh, financial and technical control. Uh, we also uh, in charge of the ONM for our wind farm. Uh, so let's go to slide seven. So our uh, milestone in, the, in Chinese market, of course, we entered Chinese market in 1983 from Daya Bay nuclear uh, power plant. And uh, until now, so we realized several uh, several projects, mainly in the uh, thermal power field in the past year. But I have to uh, um, uh, I have to uh, point out that uh, we uh, buy the UPC, the onshore uh, onshore wind farm uh, company UPC in the 20, uh, 2016. We also uh, uh, buy, uh, bought the ACC for PV roof uh, in 2018. And another uh, remarkable uh, milestone is in uh, 2016, we uh, signed the HPC Hinkley Point nuclear final contract in UK with uh, our partner CGN. So uh, in the, now we move to slides, next slide. So uh, for our assets in China, so we have, uh, as we said, we have three assets in coal field, one assets in uh, nuclear field, Aishan, uh, EPR, and for renewable, uh, so we have uh, on onshore and uh, PV. For offshore, we just signed the framework agreement for Dongtai offshore project in March in Paris when the Chinese president visited France. Uh, for this project, uh, the uh, the, the transaction is still under the final approval by SASAC. We hope to conclude very soon. And uh, for energy service field, of course, we have some projects like uh, in Sanya, Lingbao, Sanmenxia district heating, something like that. Uh, so that's the brief in the introduction of EDF uh, in China and uh, EDF renewable. Thank you very much. And sorry for the technical Difficulty. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zhou. Um, uh, let me just reintroduce you uh, due to the, the challenge at the beginning. So, Mr. Zhou is the ONM director in China of your um, for EDF Renewable. Uh, Mr. Zhou has been uh, following the Chinese power market for nearly three decades. Uh, thank you so much for your introduction uh, here, uh, Mr. Zhou, about the investment from where. From the slides where we can see you are the long-standing player has decades of experience in China first of all uh, the conventional power plant and then you switch to renewable as well uh, most recently we all are aware of that um, during the visit of Mr. Xi Jinping um, to Paris and the EDF sign uh, um, Agreement with uh, China Energy to uh, for two offshore projects in Jiangsu Dongtai. So uh, we're looking forward to see any new announcement uh, moving forward. As uh, absolutely, uh, you have this uh, early entering uh, advantage and the experience in China. So we're going to uh, stop it for now, and uh, we will invite you back to join the QA session. Thank you. Now let's switch Thank to you. Mr. Wang. Uh, Mr. Wang, before I introduce you, would you please confirm your online? Thank you. Hello, Mr. Wang. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me clearly? Okay. okay, so we can hear you. So before you start, let me just reintroduce you. Uh, Mr. Wang. So, Mr. Wang is the Deputy Secretary General from uh, China Renewable Energy Industry Association. Uh, Mr. Wang has been following closely 
on the Chinese renewable energy market over the past 13 years. So he's focused on the industry and market analysis of renewable energy, including solar PV and biomass, uh, geothermal, et cetera. So in this presentation, Mr. Wang is going to give us an update about the latest Chinese renewable energy policy, as well as the investment environment um, for renewable in China. So now the stage is yours, uh, Mr. Wang. Thank you. Hello, hello, thank you, Feng. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to share with you some information about renewable energy in China. First, firstly, I will introduce our situation briefly, followed by the policy about renewables in China, and uh, finally, is the investment uh, environment. Uh, our association is founded in 2002 with the support of UNDP and the GIF. Our motion is to promote the commercialization of uh, uh, renewable energy in China. Uh, actually, Korea is a bridge and a window and a uh, uh, platform for, me, uh, for communication. We have done a lot of research about uh, uh, renewables such as the wind power, solar PV, uh, low carbon uh, development, and biomass uh, uh, energy as well. Every year we also hold some high level activities uh, such as the China Wind Power, Offshore Wind Power Summit, International Forum on Energy Transition. All right, let's move to the, policy, the policies about renewables uh, in China. As we all know, uh, renewable energy cannot be developed with, without the support of the government. And during the past 20 years, the China government has made a lot of policies about renewables. The first one is the renewable energy law. Uh, it plays the fundamental role uh, in the development of renewable energy. And the second the policy is the energy development plan, uh, including the mid-term, and uh, the medium and long-term development plan and the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th five-year plan for renewables. The plans cl clarify the development goals of renewable energy and support the development of re renewable energy. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead, Mr. Wang. And support the development of the new Okay, support the development of the new energy at each stage. And it is a strong signal for the market and uh, attracts the investors. And the third one is uh, economic incentive policy, including the VAT reduction and uh, the income, uh, income tax exempt, exempt, uh, exemption. For example, the VAT for solar PV and wind power will be 50% uh, only. And the, the, for the uh, renewable energy products, uh, the income tax during the first, the first three years uh, uh, is, is exempted. And during the fourth to six years, it will be reduced by 50%. And uh, for the uh, land use tax, uh, if the projects uh, do not change the purpose of use of the land concerned, uh, the land use tax for solar PV projects and wind power projects will be exempted. And also the China Development Bank and Agriculture Development Bank of China uh, provide the pref uh, prefer uh, preferential loans for PV um, poverty uh, elevation projects. And uh, furthermore, the government uh, now is uh, addressing the climate change, which requires uh, to increasing the uh, the percentage of uh, renewables in the energy mix. And the national carbon tra uh, trading system is in operation, uh, in the in operation, and starting with the power sector. And uh, also, the government. Uh, is trying to promote clean heating in the northern area, and all of the, uh, those pro, uh, these policies has uh, promoted the renewable energy uh, uh, greatly in the past 20 years. 
And here is the targets uh, in the 13th five year plan about the renewable energy. You can see for the hydropower 100 and, and 40 gigawatt, for, for wind power uh, 210 gigawatt, and for solar PV projects uh, 105 gigawatt, and for CSP uh, 5 gigawatt, and for biomass power 15 gigawatt, and for solar, solar heating water. Uh, is about eight, uh, 800 million uh, square, square meters. And the geothermal is uh, uh, 16 uh, billion, uh, 1.6 billion uh, square meters. And for bioethanol is 4 million uh, tons. And for biodiesel is 2 million tons. And during the past uh, 10 years, the the cost of the wind power is decreasing year by year. So the feeding tariff is also decreasing according to, accordingly. Uh, you can see uh, from 2009 and to 2018, the, the, the tariff, the feeding tariff for onshore projects has, has been uh, decreased by over 15%. However, for the offshore projects, uh, it, it has remained the same uh, from 2015 to now. And uh, here is the latest notice on, on, on grid onshore and offshore feeding tariff uh, for, the, for the wind power. Uh, you, you can see by, 20, by 2021, there will be no subsidy for wind power, uh, for onshore wind power. And for offshore wind power, uh, now it's, it's begun auction selling price. Here is the Hello, Mr. Wang. We seems locked here. Are you still there? Thank you. Great and clean his uh, uh, and uh, according to the catalog, the pre established establishment national treatment, uh, the treatment for foreign investors shall be no less than that domestic ones. And also the negative list, if the project shall not be invested, if the, if it is uh, in the negative list. And also, the government is simplifying the procedure. No special approval is needed for the registration of foreign companies. It can get registration if it is not in the negative list, enjoying the same treatment as the Chinese investors. And also, the government has set up the regulation to promote, protect, and administer the foreign investment, enhance the service system, ensure the fair participant, uh, participation of government procurement, Assure the fair participation of the uh, making the etc. Here is the flowchart of subsidies generally is from the end users and finally to the uh, uh, renewable energy project project owner. And uh, however, we are facing some challenges for renewables in China. The first one is the subsidy delay uh, during to during the outer growth uh, in China, uh, there, there is a large amount of deficit uh, for renewable subsidies. By 2018, the, the gap uh, 
I mean, the safety is 200 billion uh, Chinese yuan. And another problem is the curtailment. Uh, and the third one is the non-technical non cost remains high. And uh, for the financing, uh, uh, includes the primary market and the secondary market. Uh, uh, before 2017, uh, the, the project owners only get the, get the uh, investment or get the financing through the primary, primary market. But from 2018, the second market, the second, uh, secondary market is beginning, including the stock, uh, bonds, and bills, etc. And uh, the state council uh, approved five provinces and regions to build a green finance reform innovation pilot zone. Uh, that is uh, Xinjiang, Xinjiang area, and uh, Zhejiang province, uh, Jiangxi province, uh, Guiyang province, and Guangdong province. Here is some activities uh, conducted by the secondary, uh, by the uh, pilot uh, Area. However, the cost of the green bonds remains high. And finally, uh, is a brief summary. Uh, energy transition is booming in China and new communities are coming. And the technology is making progress and the cost is decreasing. Renewable energy is more competitive compared to the uh, fossil fossil uh, power, and the green financing is popular. And the renewable energy can get more support from green financing, and the international cooperation is necessary for China, including technology innovation, financing, business model development, project development, operation and maintenance, etc. Uh, as you know, uh, actually some foreign investors uh, are doing very well in China. Uh, for example, uh, EDF, NG, and uh, Shell, etc. So there are a lot of opportunities in Chinese market. So welcome to China. Basically, that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wang, for your presentation to go through the latest uh, renewable energy policy in China, also the investment uh, environment, especially for the foreign investor. So now let's uh, switch back um, to the QA session. Um, before we start, uh, I just want to say thank you very much for Yunasan, Mr. Zhou, uh, Mr. Wang, for your presentation about different topics. Um, so for this QA session, the first question is about how important is generation forecasting in this industry and its role in the future? Uh, I guess that's a probably a question uh, we could invite uh, Yunasan to answer. Yunasan? Hello, Yunasan. Are you online? It seems we still have the problem with Yunnan Zen um, from Beijing. Um, but for this question, I can just quickly uh, answer. I think in general, uh, the generation forecasting uh, for the renewable itself do not really guarantee the growth of a market. I guess in general, it's still the government policy, the sports ski that will drive the growth of the market. Um, in terms of the rules for generation forecast, basically, I think. Uh, we have different international institution or independent consulting company provide the generation forecast in different parts of the world. All those forecast figures is basically uh, providing a guideline based on the latest uh, government policy, renewable uh, policy, etc. So it's just give an indication about where the wind is going to blow and how the market is to grow. But in general, the forecast itself will uh, provide a clearly indication about where is the risk and where is the opportunity, etc. So uh, again, uh, generation forecast itself is not the main driver of this renewable uh, industry, but it will provide a clearer guideline for 
the market to grow uh, in general for the energy transition. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Uh, the next question is for EDF. Um, Mrs. Zhou, uh, we got a question to you. Here it is. Is, is yes, it EDF target? Sorry, okay, let me just uh, um, bring you this question. Yes. Is it EDF target to also develop own project in the offshore market in China? Or will it be owning financial investment as a stakeholders in project? Uh, I think um, uh, up to now, uh, we have a strategy to partner with Chinese uh, uh, partners. Uh, so it means that uh, we will uh, bring our complementary added value to the project, but we have no strategy to develop offshore uh, uh, offshore wind farm along by EDF. So because you know, uh, uh, I think you, there's some concern. Uh, there's no clear uh, policy uh, strand, but uh, I think uh, the, we have some difficulty as a foreign company to access to all the uh, you know the weather data, the topographic data. So for uh, even uh, you know with some uh, very sensitive. Uh, 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 that has um, related to the project development. So that's why we prefer in Chinese market uh, to uh, partner with Chinese, uh, uh, we, 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 with our uh, strategic partners um, for the time being. We have no uh, right away, uh, right, right, uh, right now um, to do the project alone. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Mr. So actually, uh, your answer um, also asking the next question where there's one audience is asking you about ETF strategy uh, and your Chinese business model. Uh, perfect, thank you for that. So we got the next question that's also about the uh, Chinese offshore market. Um, Hello? So the question is about, yeah, uh, maybe maybe yes. Uh, uh, to answer your second question, our business model uh, in China is to, of course, uh, uh, we have a financial uh, um, target, uh, pro pro profitability target, but uh, we are not a financial investor. Uh, we are industrial investor. It means that uh, we will bring our technical value to co-manage the pro project together with our Chinese partner. Uh, so we don't, uh, uh, on, uh, we don't uh, do the pure uh, financial investment. And uh, in parallel, of course, our target is also to go abroad with our Chinese partner. For example, as we did uh, in the nuclear field, we uh, invested in the Taishan project with CTN. We also invited them to go to HPC project in UK. So that's probably our strategy and business model. Okay, all right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zhou. On top of that, uh, there's one question. Uh, when you, when EDF Renewable is looking at investment in China in offshore, do you, uh, do you basically internally require the same uh, IRR, the investment return rate, or you have different uh, you know, requirement for the investment in China? I think we have different uh, IRR uh, criteria in different country. It, it is related to the risk assessment in different country. Of course, it's associated with the, the policy, with the uh, environment, uh, with the market, uh, environmentals and with the technical risk. So uh, there's no uh, universal uh, IRR uh, criteria for India group. So we adapt to each country. Okay, uh, for the IRR offshore in China, are you looking at the double digital return rate or single digital? Thank you. I think it's double digital, I should say, but okay. it's reasonable. Okay, uh, we're clear. Thank you. So mm -hmm. the last question here uh, to all of you, uh, do you think the ambitious offshore wind development target in China can be reached with the current local supply chain? Thank you.
Mr. Zhao, you are the developer, uh, okay. co-investor in China. Can you answer this question quickly? Thank you. Uh, yes, from my personal understanding, you know, now we, the, uh, China has approved many projects uh, to be realized, to be uh, finish, to finish the construction by the end of 2021 to benefit the uh, current FIT. So uh, now I think the supply chain is facing a big challenge. Uh, personally, I don't think the actual uh, supply chain can answer all the uh, demands. I think uh, they need to uh, in improve them, increase their capacity very quickly, but it's still very difficult to realize 100% of the project approved. Maybe uh, to be, uh, to be uh, optimized, uh, maybe 80% or 70, even uh, 70 or 60% of the project will be realized. Uh, that's already a big success. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Joe, for your uh, comment about uh, how realistic it is um, the Chinese local supply chain can meet the target. Uh, we all know we have 10 gigawatt under construction. Uh, by the end of the first half, already 40 gigawatt is uh, ready to be built. So let's see how much uh, megawatt will be built uh, in the next couple of years. Um, um, but uh, in general, thank you, Yunasan, thank you, Mr. Wang, thank you, Mr. Zhou, for joining us today. Um, dear colleague from the industry who dial in for the webinar today, uh, we sincerely apologize for the challenge at the beginning due to the internet control uh, in China. We have this technical issue, but luckily we get Mr. Wang and Mr. Zhou back online and also to go through the QA session. Uh, due to the challenge, I'm sure there are some uh, information are missing, but we will recycle and share this slide and uh, uh, you can get more detail. And thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, before uh, we end up this call, I just want to mention uh, on 21st of October in the morning, uh, the Beijing Noah Hotel, GWAC is going to co-organize uh, with Sevilla, Kavia and Arena um, to launch the first edition of Beijing Renewable Energy Investment Summit. This summit will have the high profile speaker from National NEA in China, this Director General from Arena, and also CEO speaker from all the leading turbine oil manufacturers, including Vista, uh, Minyang, Goodwin, and also leading international institutions, including AIIB, also Citibanks. Uh, EKF, and from the utility side, we will have uh, the leading Chinese utility, uh, CGN, CTG, uh, and also uh, international uh, speaker join us. And uh, we're looking forward to meet all of you who is interested in this event. This event is just part of the Channel Wind Power 2019. If you go online and register the Channel Wind Power, you will be automatically granted the entry for this summit. We're looking forward to meet all of you in Beijing. Thank you very much and thank you for your time for today.